The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett. Book Twelve, A Judicial Error, Chapter One, The Fatal Day. At ten o'clock in the morning of the day following the events I have described, the trial of Dmitri Karamazov began in our district court. I hasten to emphasize the fact that I am far from esteeming myself capable of reporting all that took place at the trial in full detail, or even in the actual order of events. I imagine that to mention everything with full explanation would fill a volume, even a very large one, and so I trust I may not be reproached for confining myself to what struck me. I may have selected as of most interest what was of secondary importance, and may have omitted the most prominent and essential details. But I see I shall do better not to apologize. I will do my best, and the reader will see for himself that I have done all I can. And, to begin with, before entering the court, I will mention what surprised me most on that day. Indeed, as it appeared later, everyone was surprised at it, too. We all knew that the affair had aroused great interest, that everyone was burning with impatience for the trial to begin, that it had been a subject of talk, conjecture, exclamation, and surmise for the last two months in local society. Everyone knew, too, that the case had become known throughout Russia, but yet we had not imagined that it had aroused such burning, such intense interest in everyone, not only among ourselves, but all over Russia. This became evident at the trial this day. Visitors had arrived not only from the chief town of our province, but from several other Russian towns, as well as from Moscow and Petersburg. Among them were lawyers, ladies, and even several distinguished personages. Every ticket of admission had been snatched up, a special place behind the table at which the three judges sat was set apart for the most distinguished and important of the men visitors. A row of armchairs had been placed there, something exceptional, which had never been allowed before. A large proportion, not less than half of the public, were ladies. There was such a large number of lawyers from all parts that they did not know where to seat them, for every ticket had long since been eagerly sought for and distributed. I saw, at the end of the room, behind the platform, a special partition hurriedly put up, behind which all these lawyers were admitted, and they thought themselves lucky to have standing room there, for all chairs had been removed for the sake of space, and the crowd behind the partition stood throughout the case closely packed, shoulder to shoulder. Some of the ladies, especially those who came from a distance, made their appearance in the gallery very smartly dressed, but the majority of the ladies were oblivious even of dress. Their faces betrayed hysterical, intense, almost morbid curiosity. A peculiar fact, established afterwards by many observations, was that almost all the ladies, or at least the vast majority of them, were on Mitya's side, and in favor of his being acquitted. This was perhaps chiefly owing to his reputation as a conqueror of female hearts. It was known that two women rivals were to appear in the case. One of them, Katerina Ivanovna, was an object of general interest. All sorts of extraordinary tales were told about her, amazing anecdotes of her passion for Mitya, in spite of his crime. Her pride and aristocratic connections were particularly insisted upon. She had called upon scarcely anyone in the town. People said she intended to petition the government for leave to accompany the criminal to Siberia and to be married to him somewhere in the mines. 
The appearance of Grushenka in court was awaited with no less impatience. The public was looking forward with anxious curiosity to the meeting of the two rivals, the proud aristocratic girl and the hetaira. But Grushenka was a more familiar figure to the ladies of the district than Katerina Ivanovna. They had already seen the woman who had ruined Fyodor Pavlovich and his unhappy son, and all, almost without exception, wondered how father and son could be so in love with such a very common, ordinary Russian girl, who was not even pretty. In brief, there was a great deal of talk. I know for a fact that there were several serious family quarrels on Mitya's account in our town. Many ladies quarreled violently with their husbands over differences of opinion about the dreadful case, and it was that the husbands of these ladies, far from being favorably disposed to the prisoner, should enter the court bitterly prejudiced against him. In fact, one may say pretty certainly that the masculine, as distinguished from the feminine, part of the audience was biased against the prisoner. There were numbers of severe, frowning, even vindictive faces. Mitya, indeed, had managed to offend many people during his stay in the town. Some of the visitors were, of course, in excellent spirits, and quite unconcerned as to the fate of Mitya personally. But all were interested in the trial, and the majority of men were certainly hoping for the conviction of the criminal except perhaps the lawyers, who were more interested in the legal than in the moral aspect of the case. Everybody was excited in the presence of the celebrated lawyer, Fityukovich. His talent was well known, and this was not the first time he had defended notorious criminal cases in the provinces. And if he defended them, such cases became celebrated and long remembered all over Russia. There were stories, too, about our prosecutor, and about the president of the court. It was said that Ippolit Kirillovich was in a tremor at meeting Fedyukovich, and that they had been enemies from the beginning of their careers in Petersburg. That, though our sensitive prosecutor who always considered that he had been aggrieved by someone in Petersburg, because his talents had not been properly appreciated, was keenly excited over the Karamazov case, and was even dreaming of rebuilding his flagging fortunes by means of it. Fetyukovich, they said, was his one anxiety. But these rumors were not quite just. Our prosecutor was not one of those men who lose heart in face of danger. On the contrary, his self-confidence increased with the increase of danger. It must be noted that our prosecutor was in general too hasty and morbidly impressionable. He would put his whole soul into some case and work at it as though his whole fate and his whole fortune depended on its result. This was the subject of some ridicule in the legal world. For just by this characteristic, our prosecutor had gained a wider notoriety than could have been expected from his modest position. People laughed particularly at his passion for psychology. In my opinion, they were wrong, and our prosecutor was, I believe, a character of greater depth than was generally supposed. But with his delicate health he had failed to make his mark at the outset of his career, and had never made up for it later. As for the president of our court, I can only say that he was a humane and cultured man, who had a practical knowledge of his work and progressive views. He was rather ambitious, but did not concern himself greatly about his future career. The great aim of his life was to be a man of advanced ideas. He was, too, a man of connections and property. He felt, as we learnt afterwards, 
rather strongly about the Karamazov case, but from a social, not from a personal standpoint. He was interested in it as a social phenomenon, in its classification and its character, as a product of our social conditions, as typical of the national character, and so on, and so on. His attitude to the personal aspect of the case, to its tragic significance, and the persons involved in it, including the prisoner, was rather indifferent and abstract, as was perhaps fitting indeed. The court was packed and overflowing long before the judges made their appearance. Our court is the best hall in the town, spacious, lofty, and good for sound. On the right of the judges, who were on a raised platform, a table and two rows of chairs had been put ready for the jury. On the left was the place of the prisoner and the counsel for the defense. In the middle of the court, near the judges, was a table with the material proofs. On it lay Fyodor Pavlovich's white silk dressing gown, stained with blood. The fatal brass pestle with which the supposed murder had been committed. Mitya's shirt, with a blood-stained sleeve. His coat, stained with blood in patches over the pocket in which he had put his handkerchief. The handkerchief itself, still with blood, and by now quite yellow. The pistol loaded by Mitya at Perhotin's, with a view to suicide, and taken from him on the sly at Mokro by Trifon Borisovich. The envelope in which the three thousand rubles had been put ready for Grushenka, the narrow pink ribbon with which it had been tied, and many other articles I don't remember. In the body of the hall, at some distance, came the seats for the public. But in front of the balustrade a few chairs had been placed for witnesses who remained in the court after giving their evidence. At ten o'clock the three judges arrived, the President, one honorary judge of the peace, and one other. The prosecutor, of course, entered immediately after. The President was a short, stout, thick-set man of fifty, with a dyspeptic complexion, dark hair turning grey and cut short, and a red ribbon, of what order I don't remember. The prosecutor struck me, and the others too, as looking particularly pale, almost green. His face seemed to have grown suddenly thinner, perhaps in a single night, for I had seen him looking as usual only two days before. The President began with asking the court whether all the jury were present. But I see I can't go on like this, partly because some things I did not hear, others I did not notice, and others I have forgotten. But most of all, because, as I have said before, I have literally no time or space to mention everything that was said and done. I only know that neither side objected to very many of the jurymen. I remember the twelve jurymen. Four were petty officials of the town. Two were merchants, and six peasants, and artisans of the town. I remember, long before the trial, questions were continually asked with some surprise, especially by ladies. Can such a delicate, complex, and psychological case be submitted for decision to petty officials and even peasants? And what can an official, still more a peasant, understand in such an affair? All the four officials in the jury were, in fact, men of no consequence and of low rank. Except one who was rather younger, they were grey-headed men, little known in society, who had vegetated on a pitiful salary, and who probably had elderly, unpresentable wives and crowds of children, perhaps even without shoes and stockings. At most they spent their leisure over cars, and, of course, had never read a single book. The two merchants looked respectable. 
but were strangely silent and stolid. One of them was close-shaven, and was dressed in European style. The other had a small grey beard, and wore a red ribbon with some sort of a medal upon it on his neck. There is no need to speak of the artisans and the peasants. The artisans of Skotopringonievsk are almost peasants, and even work on the land. Two of them also wore European dress, and perhaps for that reason were dirtier and more uninviting-looking than the others, so that one might well wonder, as I did as soon as I had looked at them, what men like that could possibly make of such a case. Yet their faces made a strangely imposing, almost menacing impression. They were stern and frowning. At last the President opened the case of the murder of Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov. I don't quite remember how he described him. The court usher was told to bring in the prisoner, and Mitya made his appearance. There was a hush through the court. One could have heard a fly. I don't know how it was with others, but Mitya made a most unfavorable impression on me. He looked an awful dandy in a brand-new frock-coat. I heard afterwards that he had ordered it in Moscow expressly for the occasion from his own tailor, who had his measure. He wore immaculate black kid gloves and exquisite linen. He walked in with his yard-long strides, looking stiffly straight in front of him, and sat down in his place with a most unperturbed air. At the same moment, the counsel for defence, the celebrated Fetyukovich, entered, and a sort of subdued hum passed through the court. He was a tall, spare man, with long, thin legs, with extremely long, thin, pale fingers, clean-shaven face, demurely brushed, rather short hair, and thin lips, that were at times curved into something between a sneer and a smile. He looked about forty. His face would have been pleasant if it had not been for his eyes, which, in themselves, small and inexpressive, were set remarkably close together, with only the thin, long nose as a dividing line between them. In fact, there was something strikingly bird-like about his face. He was in evening dress and white tie. I remember the President's first question to Mitya about his name, his calling, and so on. Mitya answered sharply, and his voice was so unexpectedly loud that it made the President start and look at the prisoner with surprise. Then followed a list of persons who were to take part in the proceedings, that is, of the witnesses and experts. It was a long list. Four of the witnesses were not present. Musov, who had given evidence at the preliminary inquiry, but was now in Paris, Madame Hochlakov, and Maximov, who were absent through illness, and Smerdyakov, through his sudden death, of which an official statement from the police was presented. The news of Smerdyakov's death produced a sudden stir and whisper in the court. Many of the audience, of course, had not heard of the sudden suicide. What struck people most was Mitya's sudden outburst. As soon as the statement of Smerdyakov's death was made, he cried out, aloud from his place, He was a dog, and died like a dog. I remember how his counsel rushed to him, and how the president addressed him, threatening to take stern measures. If such an irregularity were repeated, Mitya nodded, and in a subdued voice, repeated several times abruptly to his counsel, with no show of regret. I won't again, I won't, it escaped me. I won't do it again. And, of course, 
This brief episode did him no good with the jury or the public. His character was displayed, and it spoke for itself. It was under the influence of this incident that the opening statement was read. It was rather short, but circumstantial. It only stated the chief reasons why he had been arrested, why he must be tried, and so on. Yet it made a great impression on me. The clerk read it loudly and distinctly. The whole tragedy was suddenly unfolded before us, concentrated in bold relief in a fatal and pitiless light. I remember how, immediately after it had been read, the President asked Mitya, in a loud, impressive voice, "'Prisoner, do you plead guilty?' Mitya suddenly rose from his seat. "'I plead guilty to drunkenness and dissipation,' he exclaimed, again in a startling, almost frenzied voice. "'To idleness and debauchery I meant to become an honest man for good.' just at the moment when I was struck down by fate. But I am not guilty of the death of that old man, my enemy, and my father. No, no, I am not guilty of robbing him. I could not be. Dmitri Karamazov is a scoundrel, but not a thief. He sat down again, visibly trembling all over. The president again briefly, but impressively, admonish him to answer only what was asked, and not to go off in irrelevant exclamations. Then he ordered the case to proceed. All the witnesses were led up to take the oath. Then I saw them all together. The brothers of the prisoner were, however, allowed to give evidence without taking the oath. After an exhortation from the priest and the president, the witnesses were led away, and were made to sit as far as possible apart from one another. Then they began calling them up, one by one. End of chapter 1 of Book 12 Read by J.C. Guan, Montreal, February 2009